Uh, I know that some of you are not. Um, I know that some of you are not uh, familiar with uh, hurricanes. If you're not from Florida, or even if you are from Florida, you may not have been here for the last big one. Um, New quote of the month, October, is going to be Winston Churchill. Um, I want to go over some of the, so just plain old preparations for Hurricane Matthew. And then we're actually going to talk about hurricanes in the context of pressure and energy uh, that we will need uh, for the current chapter this week on heat energy, uh, because a hurricane is actually a gigantic heat engine, very violent. Now, a couple things, you should, you could probably make a note of this if you want. I'm going to try to give you plenty of information. Uh, and just, you know, I yelled at my last class because uh, they were I consider hurricanes pretty serious pieces of activity. And I, I'm not going to be uh, joking around here when I'm talking about hurricanes and stuff. You guys ready? You guys over here ready? Are you ready? Okay. Um, now couple things of historical note. UCF, I was here in 2004, we wrote out Hurricane Charlie, direct hit on uh, UCF, it went blazing right through Orlando. Uh, raise your hand if you were here uh, in 2004 or somewhere, I mean, in Florida for Hurricane Charlie. Okay, so those of you, if you didn't raise your hand, you need to pay careful attention because it is kind of a serious thing. And especially if you're not from Florida and your mom is like up in New York or Ohio or something like that, and she's going to be worried about you down here, you want to be able to tell her you want to be able to tell her as much as you can and, and have reliable information so that she doesn't worry your head off and stuff like that. Now UCF is pretty hard. In other words, in other words, uh, you don't see a lot of uh, power lines strung on telephone poles around campus. A lot of stuff is buried, all right, and that's the secret. Have stuff underground. Um, plans exist for sheltering you guys. Uh, if you're a student that lives on campus in one of the dorms or the towers or something like that, um, I don't know about the towers, but the dorms they're going to move you out and into probably if 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 they have to shut down campus, if we get a direct hit, or if we're going to get a direct hit, um, they'll move you into different classroom buildings around campus, which is what they did during Charlie. But UCF is pretty much hardened. It, it, you know, if we get it, if it stays category four, they, they figure it's going to be category three by the time it gets up here. But Category 3 is pretty serious. And uh, if we get Category 3 direct hit, uh, UCF's not going to be destroyed, my guess. There'll be trees down. Um, you know, there'll be miscellaneous signs that are up on poles or posts that get blown away. I, you know, matter of fact, I talked to, you know, when I got to school here, I, I parked in Garage H. And there's a parking lot uh, lady there. She was giving somebody a ticket. And uh, so I, tr I tried to divert her attention, but it didn't work. 
<laughs> so whoever was getting the ticket got the ticket. But anyways, I was asking, do you guys have plans and stuff? Yeah, we're already taking down signs. They're taking down signs here and there around campus because they don't want them to become a projectile, you know, a missile. You know, if you think about it, one of these steel signs, you know, thin sheet of steel, 80 miles an hour, cut your head off. So you don't want to... Anyway, so they're going to put most of you guys, into if you're in campus, probably into like this building or something. So you're going to want to have your sleeping bag or blankets and stuff, PJs, uh, granola bars, flashlight, just stuff like that. Dasani and, you know, uh, chess, the game of life, your phone. Oh, you're going to have to have your phone charger. Uh, and believe you me, the phone, there's not that many outlets. So if you are stuck in here and your phone goes down, you're going to have to wait in line. They're going to have to take a number to get to the, the power outlet. Mike, oh, wait a minute. In this place, there's one in, under each chair, isn't there? Yeah. Oh, so if you guys get over here, you're going to be in good shape. Uh, anyways, my guess is that it's going to hit Central Florida. And that means we're going to get catastrophic damage off campus. You know, and, and right, down, right now down in Haiti... And a little bit later today in eastern Cuba, they're getting catastrophic damage. I mean, it's like a bomb going off up down there, I'm sure. Um, the projected track from all the different models and stuff, this picture is what it was last Thursday, last week. All right. And it was way out in the Bahamas. We were going to get some, a little bit of stormy weather, but nothing serious. But now it's getting closer and closer. So unless we get a cold front that blazes through, uh, you know, we're going to get some, some damage. And I cannot overemphasize it. Do not screw around. It's a very serious, uh, very serious thing. And... Um, Raise your hand if you grew up down in the Caribbean or have lived down there for a year or two. Okay, a few of you. I used to teach down in the, in the island of St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And I was there in 1998 for Hurricane George. And that came right south, a few miles south of St. Thomas. It went east to west between St. Croix and St. Thomas. And uh, it was pretty serious. If you've ever been down there or if you ever go down there uh, during hurricane season, uh, it's, it's like being in a war zone. I mean, you, people are just getting ready for war. And because down there, you get the full force of the hurricane. I mean, it is like, I will never use the word awesome again except in, re in reference to a hurricane or something of that magnitude. It is, uh, you, know, it's, you know, when I was able to observe it before it really hit, and this is before it hit, before full strength, I was thinking, you know, this is just physical awe at the power of that storm. And it wasn't even Category 5. At the time it went through, it was Category 4. We thought it was going to be Category 5. So... Uh, but it's very serious. I want to show you um, the time evolution. Go ahead and make a note of this phrase. The time evolution of Hurricane Matthew projected track across latitudes 20 to 30 degrees north. In other words, when it passes either along or through the Florida Peninsula from 20 to 30 degrees north latitude, um, that's us. That's what we want to look at. Okay, And I use the phrase time evolution uh, because... Uh, we don't really have a good time evolution equation or system of time evolution equations for hurricanes that work very well uh, for advanced prediction. But uh, some of our models are fairly good for making educated guesses. Now, here's the educated guess um, from last Wednesday, 2 a.m. And if you look at this, 
uh, they this this image this is from the website called Weather Underground, um, and Weather Underground last Tuesday or last Wednesday, uh, two a.m. The storm that we now call Matthew was out here uh, in the Atlantic. It hadn't reached Barbados yet. It was still east of Barbados. And uh, it was a tropical low. It, so it formed the Cape Verde Islands, a tropical wave. and became a low. And then on Thursday, wait a minute, let me go back to this picture here. Look at the, the projected track. Look at that, straight north. And the closest point of approach is like right maybe here, fairly close to, I don't know, Fort Lauderdale or something, a couple hundred miles off the coast. Now, if that was the prediction today, there wouldn't be any worry about UCF. We'd get some rainy weather. We'd get some rain bands. But it wouldn't be bodacious weather. But the next day, on Thursday, see where it is now? It's eased a little bit over to the left. In other words, towards Florida, to the west. All right, and down here, it's inside the uh, Windward Islands, and it is Category 1. It's got a little yellow symbol with a 1. They projected it to make this right-hand turn, basically... 90 degrees and cut north, and it has done that. And right now it's down here somewhere off the coast of Haiti. It blew through there this morning. And uh, there's a lot of suffered people in Haiti right now. And Cuba's going to get it pretty hard. They're probably getting it hard already. Now that's last Thursday. This is where it is this morning, 5 a.m. today. And look at that track. It's cutting right along our coast. And now it's getting really close. So as I say, I predict that we're going to get hit. Because every time they revise their model, see what, you know what they do with their models? You might want to make a note of this. They do have time evolution equations. They're not F equals MA. That's pretty simple. But they're trying to do the dynamics of the system. And what they do is they send those Hurricane Hunter airplanes into the heart of the storm and they measure temperature, air pressure, wind speed, uh, humidity, all that stuff, you know, a thousand times at a thousand different locations on their flight path. And then they radio it back to land and they analyze it. And then they start their prediction machine again. They have a big, gigantic computer program. It's basically like this enormously complicated spreadsheet. And what it spits out, or this model anyways, are these little kind of purpley magenta tracks. The average of them is the white track, and that's the forecast. This is called an ensemble, an ensemble of, you know, a lot of these different little purpley uh, predictions, um, the average of which is this white line. And so every time they get new data, they run it again. And even if it's just a new position for the center of the storm, they run it again. Now, the other thing that they have is all the weather measurements for the continent of North America as well, because all the cold fronts that might sweep through um, will affect the storm at some point. Uh, and right now, this thing is dipping in uh, towards Florida. Oh, boy, I am not looking forward to it. Um, anybody here from Lake Wales or thereabout? One person? Are you, are you from Lake Wales? No. Near Lake Wales? Okay. Lake Wales, back in... Two th the reason I asked about Lake Wales is, back in 2004, uh, they got hit with all three of the storms. Charlie, Francis, and Jeannie. The one place in the state, you know, that... What is that, Polk County down there? And uh, yeah, it was bad. Uh, Orlando was bad for Charlie, but... Not so bad for Francis and Jean, but uh, Lake Wales, they got it. So I'm not looking forward to this, my, my wonderful students. And I want you to be very uh, serious about it. Um, so here's a close-up. You can see how close it is. It's, they now predict it's close. As, as of this morning, uh, the weather report on Channel 9 Eyewitness News 
Uh, they were figuring 65, uh, 65 miles closest approach uh, to uh, Melbourne. Melbourne. Uh, and so that's, that means if it's 65 miles east of Melbourne, that means we're right in the middle of it here in Orlando. That's 100 miles from us. And it's a big storm. So even if we don't get the eye wall, we're going to still be in the middle of it. And people on the coast, uh, raise your hand if you're, if you're folks or, or if you, I know some of you commute, uh, live on, somewhere along the Atlantic coast from Jacksonville down to Miami. I know Caroline. Okay. You guys are going to have to really be solic solicitous of your parents to make sure that they're safe as well. So be in communication with them. Last thing, and this makes it even worse, it's moving slowly. And you know, a slow-moving thunderstorm and a fast-moving thunderstorm, you can tell the difference. I mean, a fast-moving thunderstorm, it'll pour. But then, five, you know, we had one Thursday last week. You know, about 10, 15 minutes later, it, was, it, it wasn't a deluge. But there for about 5 or 10 minutes, it was coming down like the days of Noah. All right? And I was thinking, I'm going to have to get a rowboat to get home. But it was through pretty fast. Now, sometimes we get thunderstorms that kind of... They're just the way the weather is, they move slowly and they dump. They dump and they dump because there's a lot of water in the atmosphere. And the conditions are right and it moves slowly, they're going to dump a lot. Now this thing is moving slowly, but it's not just dumping water. It's blowing. Very 100 mile an hour and more, 150 mile an hour maybe. I mean, Haiti's getting torn up with 150 mile an hour wind. And we have our buildings up here in Florida, most of them, especially the newer ones built since the 90s, they have better construction than most of the houses down in, in the Caribbean, or at least especially in Haiti. So we wouldn't want a Category 4 here. It would tear up Florida. I can't even imagine what Haiti's going through now. And boy, oh boy, my heart really goes out. Those guys are getting hit hard. They've had a lot of stuff bad the last five or ten years. Anyways, I want you to be informed. That the best thing that you can do is to educate yourself about what we are observing. All right. So this is actually some instruction. And I'm going to be talking about pressure. I'm going to be talking about location, uh, positions, and stuff. So think of this as uh, uh, notes uh, for lecture today. Okay, here's a picture of where... Uh, we are right now, we're the storm. Actually, it's about 5 o'clock this morning when I was putting this together. Um, here's the storm down here. The eye of the storm is, at that time, was just south of Haiti. Now I'm sure it's somewhere between Haiti and uh, Cuba. And we're way up here in Orlando, so that's kind of the, the lay of the land there. Let me get you close up. So here's Orlando up here. Uh, and the Bahamas are kind of halfway between the two places. So here's us up here, Palm Beach and so forth. And then down here is Port of Prince. So I'm guessing the storm is, it, it was heading north to the Bahamas. And so I'm guessing it's somewhere over here. This little white blip here where my cursor is, uh, that's uh, Guantanamo Bay, Gitmo. Uh, that's the U.S. Naval Base down there. So they're getting, they're getting blazed up. Uh, so information, basic information, National Hurricane Center uh, run by NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I have a bunch of satellites, um, nhc.noaa.gov. Here's what their uh, intro page looks like. So when you hover over the symbol for Hurricane Matthew, you get this little uh, pullout. And it gives you the basic specs, like your location. Uh, this is the 5 a.m. location, 17.8 north latitude, 74.4 uh, west longitude. And the mo movement, look at that, nine miles an hour. Taking its time. It ain't moving very fast at all. Uh, central pressure, we'll talk about that. Sustained winds and so forth. Category 4. Here's what the advisories look like. And 
Uh, right down here towards the bottom, uh, we're going to talk about these numbers down here, specifically the central pressure. Uh, so you can go to that website. Another good website for the satellite imagery, and we're going to look at some in, a, in just a second, is uh, noaa.gov slash satellite.php. By the way, all these URLs, I've already blurbed them up in the additional readings page inside web courses. So don't worry that you, if you don't copy each address uh, verbatim. Just make a note. Satellite imagery. Okay, here's what that page looks like. National Hurricane Center, latest satellite imagery. And what I usually do is I go down the page. Um, this, this word here, GOES, that's like an acronym for... It's for, it's for a weather satellite. You know, it takes uh, infrared and visible light uh, images of weather, uh, big ones, big pictures. And they post the, the latest data here. This is really cool. Um, down the page, I usually look at the Western Atlantic, and you'll see big pictures. Now, we're going to look at some here just so that you can know what to look for and, and kind of how to analyze it a little bit. And I want you to be educated. I don't want you to be ignorant. I want you to be on your toes, but I don't want you to be afraid. Okay? And uh, even if it gets to be a, uh, a big major hurricane strike on Orlando, uh, just make sure you know exactly what's happening if you can. So we're going to look at the visible light image. Um, and that's something that you see on the Weather Channel and Channel 9 Eyewitness News and stuff. Another one you see on TV... Water vapor image. We'll take a look at that in just a second. Uh, I'll take a look at the shortwave infrared. IR means infrared on this list. And you can look at all of them. There's all kinds of them. The other one we're going to look at is the Dvorak uh, method uh, image. Um, and there's all these other ones. Here's unenhanced uh, Funk Top is uh, developed by a guy named Funk. Uh, AVN is, for, is a, just a different infrared image uh, for aviation. Um, anyways, you can look at these. Here's, here's goes east, visible. It's about 5.15 a.m. Now notice down here the time, 9.15 UTC. UTC means Greenwich Mean Time, Universal Coordinated Time, they call it. And we're about four hours... behind them. So 9.15 UTC means 5.15 here in Orlando. So this is what the visible image of Earth looked like uh, from space, from the GOES East satellite, uh, about 5.15 this morning. So when you guys were getting up out of bed or maybe still snoring and snoozing, um, and I was up drinking coffee, making this off, this is what the overhead... And you can see the See the eye right there. All right now, I don't know how you, if you can maybe make an image or make a note here, uh, but definitely go back and look at this. And look at, in the next couple days, look at your visible goes east. Uh, you can see the eye in this one. Let's take a look at water vapor. This is another one you see on television. Uh, and this one's false color. Uh, you can see the eye up here right here where the big black and white arrow is. And this one's got false color. The, the, the previous one was black and white. So uh, this one's false color. In other words, it's infrared. And, uh, and then they, they map the intensity with different colors. That's what you got here. And down here at the bottom, this is the false color scale. Now over here on the left, right above the word OCT for October, you can see it's a little bit kind of brownish orange. It looks like the surface of Mars. Actually, that's the color of the surface of Mars. Anyways, that's dry air. And when you watch the news on TV, sometimes they'll show it to you. That's up here. See up here, just to the west, between Louisiana and Florida, out here in the Gulf Coast, that's kind of brownish orange. That means the air out there is pretty dry right now. right? And dry air is the enemy of hurricanes. Moist air is the friend of hurricanes. Okay, You have to have moisture. You can't have hurricanes in a desert. 
So if this thing was to suddenly bolt southeast, southeast and blaze into this, um, it would decapitate the storm. Uh, but unfortunately, there's no F equals MA uh, blazing this thing down to the southeast. It's just kind of sitting there for now. Now, the other colors over here, black in this image and dark blue mean the most water vapor. Okay, that's the other end. So right underneath this number 60 for uh, longitude, west longitude 60 here, uh, blue and then a little bit of purple over there, black over here. That's the inner colors here. That means where you have a lot of water uh, vapor. And make a no note to yourself, a hurricane is a thermal engine. It's a heat engine. The gas, it's like a steam engine in an old railroad train. You know, in the old time cowboy movies and stuff. And the uh, fluid in it is water. Water vapor. And in the ocean, liquid water. And they both uh, have the capacity to store enormous amounts of energy. Uh, thermal energy. Okay, here's uh, IR shortwave. And down here, again, this is false color. Look what it says down here. Goes east on the very bottom. And it says IR channel 2. They have various infrared scanners that make these images. And this is from uh, channel number 2. All right, and here's the time down here. Now, you can see the, the eye here. Notice it looks different. It kind of disappears in this frequency of infrared on this channel. Now there's different reasons for them to look at this, but if you, if you look at the center here, you can see that it looks like it's all kind of dark blue. There's not much variation, see that? Now the previous slide, look at all the variation in the water vapor, right? So we're picking up a lot of variation in the water vapor, but not a whole lot in infrared channel two. So and here's this other big storm over here. All right. So, uh, but this uh, frequency, the short wave channel uh, of infrared uh, is useful to uh, the weather guys. Right, here's another one. This is the Dvorak. Now this one's grayscale, it's not false color, it's, we call it grayscale, because it's all just different shades of gray. And this one is specifically used to analyze for intensity. And side note, um, predicting the path of a hurricane is relatively easy. We can do a fairly good job for a day, two days, maybe even three days. But predicting, side note number two, predicting intensity of a hurricane is very difficult. But this is one of the tools that they use, um, specifically developed by Professor Dvorak, uh, to uh, try to get a handle on predicting the intensity. And you can see the eye of the storm up here, still the same location. This is the 5.15 a.m. image. Uh, but you can see different structure in the, in the grayscale here. All right, now that is significant. So if you were one of these guys down in Miami at the National Hurricane Center trying to make heads or tails, now what's the intensity going to be on Tuesday? What's the intensity going to be on Thursday? You know, it's going to be sl sliding by Miami on Thursday, and I don't want it to blow the roof off my house. You know, those guys at the Hurricane Center, they, you know, they got houses. You know, so they're going to be looking at this real hard. And they want to, they want to pre the, the way that you protect the United States is being able to predict the intensity at, in any city that you want. Now, we can't really do that very well, but we try to do our best. And this is one of the tools. So if they see a city that's going to get hit with a lot of intensity, they can say, okay, you guys better evacuate or batten down the hatches or whatever it is that they think is the, the emergency plan. Now, the thing that's going to rescue us, if we do get rescued, is the jet stream. And the jet stream steers these cold fronts 
uh, from the uh, land of polar bears all the way down here to Orlando and even further south into the Caribbean in the winter. Um, and the AccuWeather site uh, is pretty good. I mean, there's other places that have it, but here's the surface map over here on the left. And it just shows you the cold fronts. Now, this cold front right here in the middle of the United States, it's kind of threading its way uh, through, let's see, that would be uh, South Dakota, Nebraska, uh, Kansas, Oklahoma, Panhandle of Texas, and on down. Now, if that can blaze over in our direction in the next 48 hours, we might just have a chance to dodge the danger of Hurricane Matthew. The other thing to look at is the jet stream. Now, right now, the jet stream is not our friend. The jet stream is, is, is the friend of this cold front. But right now, the jet stream, today's jet stream anyways, uh, not looking so helpful. All right, so that particular, and there's other places to look at the jet stream, not just AccuWeather, but. Now, if you want to do positions, you know, you can look up the latitude and longitude of the eye of the hurricane. They always provide that. And Orlando's got a position. Um, I use the website called gpsvisualizer.com. Here's what it looks like. Um, and what you, let me close in on this. What you do is you type in the latitude and longitude. You might want to write this down. I didn't put this on the blurb page or on the additional readings page uh, before class, but I'll do it after class. Uh, 28.6012 north latitude and negative 81.2011. Uh, that's uh, a long, or that's the same as 81.2011. West longitude. Uh, that's like the center of campus, somewhere between um, the Student Union and the John T. Washington Center, so over by Chick Fil A or so. Uh, so that's a good that's a good location to have in your GPS. You know, get to Chick Fil A, and here's the location. So the the NHC advisory will give you the I location. And then this is going to be, you know, this is UCF Center, UCF, so you can use that if you want. Or, like, you can look up your mom's house, you know, see if she's, you know, she, she, if she's safe or, or what. Uh, and then you click this button that says distance here. And when you do that, um, it gives you a readout. Let me focus in on this. Here are the distances. And this is from UCF to the eye of the Hurricane Matthew. And it gives you kilometers, miles, and nautical miles. And the initial bearing is 148.527 degrees. Um, and so 859 miles. Then if you click over here where it says draw a map, it'll actually give you a map uh, of the, basically of a crow, the direction a crow would fly from uh, the center of Orlando here, or center of campus here, down to the eye of the storm. And that's the uh, map that I have here. It's the one that we started with. So you can generate these maps and kind of see where this, the eye of the storm is in relation to UCF or any other location. By the way, um, let's go back to this. If you look down here where it says calculate the distance between two addresses, or draw a direct route between airports. You can actually put like MCO and uh, JFK for the two airports, and it'll give you the you know the distance or the route that a crow or a jet would fly between airports. And here in this one, calculate the distance between two addresses. You could put like uh, Castleberry, Florida, and uh, Dubuque, Iowa. And it will give you the route that a crow would fly between, you know, any of those two cities. I use this all the time, you know, for when I'm reading stuff, figuring out where it is. So let's uh, take a look at these maps. Now, one thing I want to make um, uh, known to you is the maps. Um, you can, this little thing up here at the upper right where it says Google Hybrid, uh, that's like a hybrid of a highway map and Google Earth, as you can see. Uh, even though most of this is over water, 
But you can generate different versions. Like here's, this is like, you can see highways in Florida on this map. And you can see some highways down here in Cuba, Haiti and stuff, Jamaica. Um, so you can just do different variations of maps and stuff. All right. Now, I want to pause uh, for questions about the hurricane, hurricane preparations, and any questions you may have. Uh, go ahead. If the, the question was, if the power goes out, do they have generators on campus? You're from Key West? Yeah, so you guys know hurricane prepar preparations down there. you got to. Yeah, the answer to that is why, yes. You know where there's a good... That you've probably walked by it about 17,000 times. If you go... I'm trying to think how to... There's this like open area between the tech commons and the business admin building. And you kind of walk behind it and you, you cut out and you, you're kind of looking at towards chemistry and the, and the, what's the other place? The play where they have plays. The, the theater, yeah. So it's kind of, I'm a scientist, I don't you know. Again, anyways, so you walk through there and there's this big thing. It looks like a semi. It looks like a, it's up on a big platform. It's about as big as a semi-trailer. And then if you look on top of it, there's big smokestacks. That's an emergency generator. You know what that's for? For the computer system. All right? Now, they've got other emergency generators, I'm sure, all over the place. Matter of fact, I think there's one over by physics. And they got them inside buildings and stuff and on top of buildings and stuff. So as I mentioned, I believe at the beginning of class, the UCF, expect UCF to be functioning. You know, they, they might shut down buildings that are evacuated, just turn the power off to conserve power. But I expect UCF to be, you know, running no problem. You know, they're, pro they're probably not going to try to burn a lot of power. So, I, I, for instance, do you guys, if you live in, raise your hand if you live in Libra, the Libra complex. There's only two, one, three, okay. Do you guys like eat at the, what's that place, the market? It used to be called Marketplace. 63 South. 63 South. 63 South. That's like 27 North. That's the latitude of UCF. Hmm. Okay, it, that, that place, 63 South, is probably going to be closed. Right? So you're going to have to survive on Slim Jims and granola bars and beef jerky and Monster. And, you know, it's not, so there's not going to be the Monster, the, the soda pop machines, you guys that are living in Libra and all, you're going to be shepherded, you know, possibly with some guy behind you with a pitchfork or tasers or something to get you out of there. Because they're, they're definitely going to want to get you out of the dorms. And you'll be in one of these rooms. You might be in this one uh, or in this building somewhere. And the soda machines are going to be done. Even if they have power, they're going to be empty in about two seconds. But my guess, to answer, to answer your question, uh, there's going to be power. Uh, maybe not a huge amount. But you'll have lights. You, you'll have water. Uh, you'll pro they'll probably get food to you somehow, uh, hot food maybe, or or maybe soup or something like that. But it's it's probably going to last overnight. It's going to be Thursday night and into Friday morning if it does hit us. Uh, so you might so um, we'll probably have class Thursday. I'm planning to have class Thursday, um, but you might have classes canceled Friday. So yeah, I know. Darn it. Why can't they just cancel classes Monday and call it, call it good? But, um, question. Yeah, I, well, if it moves slowly, we'll be getting our, you know what, rained on for a week. I mean, so I'm expecting tomorrow to start getting rain bands. 
And we'll be getting those rain bands for, you know, just, what was that one that just blew through, that tropical storm? Uh, yeah, Hermione. 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 Uh, Hermine, we had that, remember? We had rain for like 10 days. The rain bands on that thing were ginormous. So, but it, the, the evacuation, the rain we can handle. I mean, it's a pain in the butt, but, but the storm, the wind, that's the damaging part, and they're going to want to protect all the students that they can. Now, I have no idea. Who lives in the towers? Anybody live in the towers? Have they set anything up for hurricane plans for the towers? Boy, they haven't talked to you. I guarantee you the, the, they're thinking about it. President Hit and all the big shots, the campus police. Another question. Yes. How hard do you think it would be to drive here from far away? In 100 miles per hour wind, well, this is assuming that your brain has been replaced by some machine because a normal person would not want to do that. I mean, yeah, so you have to be, you'll have to sell four hours to Miami, right? Yeah, so you're going to be driving toward the storm if you have if you have to bail out tomorrow night and drive to Miami. But why would you do that? Oh, so are you used to it? Yeah. <laughs> Famous last words. I don't care. And then they and then and then the sheriff's deputies. You know, don't do it, sweetheart. Just be try to. Drive to oh, drive to Miami. No, drive to campus. From Miami. No. no. Drive. You mean drive from? Oh, so you live off campus. <laughs> Point Sienna. She lives in Kissimmee, so she has to drive from Kissimmee to campus. For Kissimmee to campus. You can do it, but you need like a heavy car. <laughs> a heavy car that can't be tipped off. I wouldn't. Kissimmee to Orlando. So this, I, I'm, I'm going to say that Thursday you should be able to do it, but you're going to have to leave campus early on, as early as you can on Thursday. But Friday, if there's any, if there's any problem, it's going to be fr Thursday night and Friday. And so if if they have to cancel class on Friday, don't just take the day off. Because it, it had, when we had chart, you wouldn't believe it. Two thousand four, we had infinity disruptions of, of like, people can't come up to campus. Yeah, I had one guy, Dr. B. I can't come to the midterm today because my house is surrounded by water. He lived up in Deltona. You know, so what can you say? But, anyways, yeah. The question was, what if you know somebody that's driving down to Miami on Thursday for the weekend? Are they going to be good? And, boy, I would not want to be that person because they're driving right into it. And so, you know the Turnpike or 95. You want to get struck, stuck there on the Turnpike or 95? So if you know that person, I'm not saying it's you, but if you know that person, tell them, don't do it. Just go like this. You know, like, you know. All right. So just to reinforce, we will have regular lecture on Thursday, day after tomorrow, and exam two next Thursday. Um, and so just, I'm not dismissing you guys from Thursday class. We're going to have it. Uh, and if, if President Hitt decides to change everybody's plans, so be it. That'll probably be sometime tomorrow. All right? If it happens. Now, I want to get down to some physics concepts with you.
Kitchiatric glass. Um, and that is um, the central pressure. And this is a little blurb from the National Hurricane Center, They're one of their advisories. This is the 8 a.m. advisory. I did this one uh, when I got up to campus. Uh, 934 millibars. What is that? Well, we're going to talk about that. And over here to the, to the right, 27.58 inches. That's another common way in the United States to express the barometric pressure at the center, anywhere, center of the storm in this case. So let's talk about this. Uh, what is pressure and what is a pressure differential? A pressure differential is the reason that we have this enormous uh, complex weather system. So let's talk about pressure and then the pressure differential. Pressure is a property of bulk matter. It's not really a property of a single molecule, but a collection of zillions of molecules or atoms. Uh, usually, uh, we think of the pressure of a gas or a liquid. You can make statements about the pressure in a solid. You can exert pressure with the solid, create pressure with the solid. And what the pressure is, it is a, a measurement you know, so when you fill up your bike tires or your car tires, you set it to 65 PSI or 32 PSI for your car tires or something in that order. And you fill it up. And, the pre and that's the thing that you go by. The pressure encodes a zillion molecules exchanging momentum, delta P, with the walls of the container the hypothetical surface that they find themselves in, per second. So every second, there, there might be 1.5 times 10 to the 26 collisions per second, and each of them delivers so many kilogram meters per second of momentum to the wall or to the surface that you're examining. And so if you go on the basis of square centimeter for square centimeter, square inch for square inch, you have a pressure. Now let's look at that. So if you're measuring square inch by square inch, you might be talking about a bicycle tire or scuba tanks. I believe scuba tanks are filled up to a certain number, thousands of PSI. A bicycle tire may be 60 or 70 or 80 PSI. Um, Atmospheric pressure is measured in, you know, square meters is the metric unit that we would use. Millibars is based on metric, uh, you know, so, so many newtons per square meter. So much delta P over delta T per square meter. Uh, and, there, and there's other uh, measurement systems. So to, to reinforce and to, to inform you of that, uh, remember that delta P over delta T, the change in momentum over the change in time, the time rate of change of momentum, that's the net force. That's one of the ways that Sir Isaac Newton wrote his second law. The impulse formula is related to that. Net force times delta T equals delta P, change in momentum. Okay, so, so a given amount of momentum exchanged per second is going to be a Newton of force or a pound of force in the English system. Force per unit area, so so many um, newtons of force exerted by all those collisions per square meter will give you a pressure. Okay, so in the um, English system, pounds per square inch. You know, if you're a plumber, a lot of times they'll, they'll think in terms of the water pressure in PSI. Atmospheric pressure is about 14.7, I believe, PSI. So you're, you're at the bottom of an ocean of air right now. The weight of all of that exerts about 14.7 pounds for every square inch. So a square inch is like, well, a square inch. 
in the metric system, a Pascal is one Newton per square meter. Okay, the metric unit of force and a square meter. All right. And so, as I, I said, that, that would be, you know, PSI is what you would use. Actually, I think they also have Pascal on European tires. Anybody ever notice that? It would be capital P, lowercase a, Pascals. Anybody is a bike maniac that knows, has ever seen that on tires? You've never seen it? I think they've got it. I think I saw that once. And PSI for sure. Okay, now, um, second page. Let's go back to this 934 millibars. Um, another unit of measurement is the millibar and the bar. Bar is from the Greek prefix uh, or the Greek root word for weight. So barometric pressure is the amount of weight pressing down uh, on you from the atmosphere. And uh, so we use the word bar for that. Um, on the Weather Channel and on WFTV Channel 9 Eyewitness News, um, Channel 13, Bright House Networks, etc., they'll talk about millibars. But sometimes, like I was on weather.com this morning, and they had the pressure in um, inches. And that's inches of mercury, the weight of so many inches of mercury. Um, now, atmospheric pressure, let's talk about that. The standard for what we consider the full um, pressure of one Earth atmosphere is um, the weight of the air on a day with fair weather at sea level. Now, you may say to yourself, Dr. B, why are you specifying sea level? And doesn't the air weigh the same? I mean, it's air. It's pretty light. And the answer to that is NO. If there's a lot of water in the air, water is really heavy. Water vapor. And it's way heavier than oxygen. I mean, H2O, that's two, that's two hydrogens and an oxygen. That's way heavier than an oxygen atom. Okay? And so, yeah, you've got to take into account all that stuff, and you can measure it. So fair weather... Um, on a fair weather day at sea level, uh, yeah, you have is considered one atmosphere, and the measurement for that this is considered one atmosphere, a thousand and thirteen point two five millibars, All right? And just to elucidate why I say at sea level. If you think about it, if, if your location is Denver, that's about a mile up, mile altitude. And there's less atmosphere above you if you're walking around in Denver. So there's less atmospheric pressure. So if it's a pretty nice day, fair weather, in Denver, you've got a lot less air above your coconut. Sea level, you've got the maximum. Okay. So actually, you know, the maximum would be uh, like the Dead Sea, down by the Dead Sea in Israel, because that's actually below sea level. Or, yeah, it's below sea level. Or Death Valley, that's below sea level too. Anyway, um, now, this morning at 5 a.m., Matthew was 934 millibars. And so, you know, that's... You may think, well, that's pretty, that's pretty darn it, Dr. B, that's pretty close to 1,000 millibars. What are you talking about? But yeah, it is fairly close. And just to compare, um, this morning in Antigua, uh, about 833 miles to the east, the atmospheric pressure was 1,013.90. That's a lovely day. It was, you know, it's, it's a nicer day in Antigua than it is here in Florida. I mean, it's 82 degrees over there. It's, we're sweating in the 90s up here in Florida. So and here's a picture. Right? GPS visualizer again. Yeah. Uh, 
So over here on the left, uh, where the eye of the storm is, over it's a little bit north of there now, but uh, 5 a.m., yeah. Cata catastrophic weather in Haiti. And you're talking about a walk in the park, a lovely day in Antigua. Go to the beach. Now, they got hit by storms last week, but not too hard because it was pretty far north of the track. But uh, they're fair weather over there today, pretty much. And so the pressure differential, delta P, is negative 79.25. So from fair weather, uh, uh, 1013.25 down to 934 is uh, negative 79.25, a dip. And it's relatively small. By the way, the change in pressure, delta P, be careful because this is another um, symbol that we use two different ways. The letter P, in this case, we're talking about a pressure, so be alert to the context. And other context, just a little few minutes ago, we were talking about delta P, the change of momentum, the exchange of momentum. So you have to be, unfortunately, we don't have infinity symbols uh, to use. And so this one is, you just got to be alert to the context. Both yeah, both delta P. Huh? I don't know. There's no like central, it's just basically physics scientists being eggheads that, you know, they don't think you know, ahead. You know, so, but, you know, it's just the foible of the English language that, Pressure, you know, I don't know what the word for, does anybody know what the word for pressure would be in Espanol? Presio. Okay, so that's letter P too. But like maybe German, it, I don't know what it is in German. I'll have to look it up. Anyways, in English, you got to deal with it. Just deal with it. Anyways, this is a pretty small dip. There's the calculation. So negative 79.25. Uh, millibars divided by 1013.25 millibars. That's a dip of 0 0.0782, so about 7.8%. And my wonderful students, I want to emphasize something to you, uh, and that is the word nonlinear. Go ahead and make a note uh, by 2D. Two, very small delta P, dip of 7.8%. Write down the word with stars next to it or sparkles or something. Uh, nonlinear, N-O-N-L-I-N-E-A-R, nonlinear. Weather is a, what we call a nonlinear system. And I'll give you two examples that you can contrast to bring out the meaning of nonlinear. Um, if you, the first example will be a linear or a normal system, and that is um, income. So, side note number one, income. If you have $100 of income, and a friend of yours has 107.82 dollars of income, Or in general, if you have a, an income and your friend has 7.82% more income than you, then you can say that the, your, your um, standard of life, standard of living is about the same. You know, the things that you're able to afford, your friend will be able to afford. And, and what he affords, you can probably afford. So when you're talking income, standard of living, 7.8% is different, but not huge, right? So it's not like if you're driving a beater of a car and your friend has 7.82% more income, he's not like driving a new Tesla, okay? He's maybe buying, you know, your, your beater might be a 2003 beater and he might have a 2008 beater, okay? Or if, he's, if you're driving a 2010 Corolla, Toyota Corolla, your friend might be buying 
uh, driving a 2013 Corolla, maybe. All right. He might go to Starbucks a few more times a month than you do. You know, he may uh, he may uh, eat steak a little bit more than you do, and you you might eat a little bit more macaroni and cheese than he does. All right. So, but so that's a linear system, a normal system, and a little bit of percentage doesn't equate to a huge change in standard of living, right? You know, so the delta in your standard of living is not ginormous if you're talking income. Now the standard of living in ha the, 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 the weather in Haiti right now is 7.8% lower than the weather in Antigua. But the difference in the weather in this nonlinear system is catastrophic. The pressure differential is small, but the, the weather itself is catastrophically different, right? And that is typical of a nonlinear system. Side note number three. So side note number one, income. Side note number two, weather, catastrophic, nonlinear effects. We would call it a nonlinear effect. Small change, huge outcome. Huge difference in the outcome. Side note number three. Weather is inherently nonlinear, and therefore it is inherently not predictable. You are not going, no matter if you're smarter, uh, if, if you're as smart as Sir Isaac Newton, to the power of 70. You're, you're not going to get it. It's, we've proven mathematically that weather is not predictable. And you may say to yourself, Dr. B, well, how come we have all these predictions and stuff? Those are called probabilistic. Those are basically educated throws of the dice. You know, we, we, we give it a, as much F equals MA as we can, and we know that they're going to go astray. They're not going to work for more than a day or two, maybe three days at most. They're probabilistic, all right? They're, and that is because it is inherently nonlinear. So that's the best we can do. Now, keeping going with our heat energy topics, you, let's, let's think about this question. Where does all that energy come from that drives the weather? It comes from the sun. This is a false color. This is an ultraviolet image of the sun from back in 2014. And you can look this up on the internet all the time, you know, when, whenever you want. Infrared, this is not infrared, it's ultraviolet. Mill the bright blue and the almost white areas here uh, are the areas of the sun's atmosphere that are about a million degrees temperature, so really hot. All right? And all the energy in Hurricane Matthew that we get is from that. It's from the sun. So solar energy drives all of the uh, currents in the oceans of the earth. Because water stores enormous amount of heat energy from the SUN. I mean, it reflects. So you, you can blind your eyes from the, the sun reflected off water. So that reflection that blinds your eyes is not heating up water. But it still absorbs quite a bit of uh, solar energy. And because all the, current, all the oceans of the earth are controlled by the amount of heat that they get by the sun, from the sun, um, all the weather systems on Earth are therefore controlled by the SUN. And this is one of the reasons why this, this whole idea of global warming and climate change is so difficult. I mean, climate change is difficult. It's a nonlinear system, so very, it's very rough. But also, the, the SUN is this big, huge source of energy, and uh, you have to take that into account as well. Here's an example. So this would be like 1C. You've heard of this weather pattern, El Nino? And it's, and it's, uh, its little sister, La Nina. You know, just the opposite. El Nino, we think of it as a weather pattern, but you know what really starts it? It's, um, it starts with variations in the ocean currents in the Western Pacific, all the way over by Indonesia. In Australia, the weather current, the, excuse me, the ocean currents there change 
And by the time they get to the other side of the Pacific, South America, it shows up as, you know, what they observed, La Nina and El Nino. You know, those winter uh, winds. I think it's winter. Yeah, because it comes at Christmas, typically. And so that is controlled by the oceans of Earth. The Gulf Stream is another. So this would be one, uh, one D. The Gulf Stream. If you think, if you go to the map of the Earth, and you look at the latitude of Paris, France, you know everybody's always saying, "Oh, Paris, France, so romantic and all that stuff." Yeah, but did you know that most of Canada is is at the same latitude, or Paris, France is at the same latitude as Canada? Winnipeg, Canada, it's about the same latitude. Winnipeg and Winnipeg, that's ice hockey, you know, long winters. The polar bears don't roam down that far. But they got really cold winters up there. But because of the Gulf Stream, the ocean current that goes up the, the east coast of North America and all the way over there to almost to, to Norway, it warms up all that part of the earth. Completely different current. If it were that far north and away from the Gulf Coast, or away from the Gulf Stream, you'd have a lot of cold, just like Winnipeg, Canada. Now, the solar constant, what is it? It's the amount of energy that the sun deposits at the top of our atmosphere. So, because the atmosphere will absorb it, and the atmosphere will reflect it. Clouds will reflect some of it away. But the, what we think the sum total that gets to Earth per square meter is 1,061 joules per second. Now, uh, number 2B here. A joule per second is also known as a watt. One joule per second is known as a watt. One watt second is known as a joule. Go ahead and write that down. One watt second is a joule, equals one joule. All right? One watt hour is 3,600 joules. One kilowatt hour is 3,600,000 joules. A watt times a, a period of time is an amount of energy. So when you are paying the electric bill at your apartment, it's, you're paying for kilowatt hours. You know, like nine cents an hour, or nine cents per kilowatt hour. Okay. And that's for every square meter that's facing directly toward the sun. So you can't go like to the North Pole because if you're up there in the Arctic, you know, most of the, the surface of the Earth is kind of tilted away from the sun. But if you go all the way down to Brazil, you know, you're facing and you look straight up, you're looking straight up at the sun at noon anyways. Okay. And so that's what it means, uh, a square meter facing directly to the sun. Now, I cut out this from Google Maps, this square of UCF. On the north, it's batted by McCulloch. On the left, to the west, it's batted by Alafaya. Uh, on the east, it's bound by the east boundary. And on the south, I wanted it to be a square, and it is a square. I went just a little bit past Nike. So this is somewhere, I don't know, down by the police, campus police building. Okay, so those are the boundaries. 1.96 kilometers, about 6,440 6, feet, approximately. And if you go out there with, you know, some surveyor tools, you could figure it out to the nearest inch if you want. Now, that's about 3.85 million square meters. Uh, 1.96 kilometers is 1,960 meters, or excuse me, 1,960 meters. So square that and you get 3.85 million square meters. And that means if every one of those 3.85 million meters, square meters, catches 1061 watts, that means that the energy dropping onto UCF, this, this is most of UCF, not quite all of it, but this square of UCF is about 4.09 gigawatts, or gigawatts, if you use that pronunciation. 
Now you may say to yourself, Dr. B, so what? What is a, what is a gigawatt anyways? You know, it's this, it's nice. Well, here's something that produces 6.809. Grand Coulee Dam, the biggest hydroelectric facility in the United States. Go ahead and write that out. Grand Coulee Dam out in Washington State. I've been there. I've been in the middle, down through the, the dam itself, where they let the public go on tours. 6.809 gigawatts. Now think about that. That's the Columbia River. And behind that dam, they dam up, you know, they get a big, basically a big pile of water. They siphon water for the top few feet of it, and they drop it down. They drop all that GPE into a tube, and it spins a turbine on a generator, and the generator makes electricity. They sell it to everybody in Washington State, Portland, Oregon, California, all over the West. Probably up in Canada once in a while, too. All right, now that's one, that's our biggest the Russians have a couple big ones, and the Chinese, I think, have a bigger one. But Grand Coulee, that's, that's pretty big. Most of our nuclear plants are not quite that big. They're gigawatts, but not this big. This is one of the bigger ones. Okay. Now, UCF gets just a little bit less than that. And UCF, this is the, this, that's not even two kilometers, 1.96 kilometers across. 1.96 kilometers high. And that's just a, that's, that's a little teeny part of the USA. You know how many times you can fit that square of UCF into the United States? 2.5 million times. And that's the amount of energy. So think of it as the energy from a couple million, a couple million Grand Coulee dams. And that's what the sun provides... It's not even breathing hard. It can do that for billions of years. And that's just the United States. Think about how big the oceans are. That's most of the surface of the earth. And that's how many joules per second we got. Now you're talking about way more than the equivalent of a nuclear weapon. The biggest nuclear bomb that, that the Russians have or that the U.S. has, is, a, is like, I don't even, it's like a firecracker compared to this. This is a lot of energy. All right, your homework nine is going to be activated about 2 p.m. You're dismissed. I'll see you on Thursday. Be alert for announcements, though.